Full fat RTX 3070, 8 core Ryzen 5800H, 165 Hz, 16 by 10 QHD display for 2.7K SGD, or about 2000. 300 US dollars. Specs alone, this laptop right here, the Aftershock Rebel 16R, seems to be pretty impressive from the get go. But usually, specs aren't enough to be that impressive to really make people at Linus Tech Tips give it a glowing review. So, what is it about the Aftershock Rebel 16R that made it so interesting? to Alex from LTT. Now, I want to start by prefacing this and saying that apart from a few minor differences like the logo, the Aftershock laptop I have here is pretty much identical to the electronics one that LTT reviewed a couple of days ago in a video titled This Alienware Clone Might Be Better Than Alienware. That video is a pretty good video and gave this model of laptop, which is made by the same ODM as that laptop in that video, a pretty positive review, which is why I am checking it out now because, well, I was interested to see how it will perform. Also, it being the same is not really a bad thing, it's just how modern global manufacturing works. And with brands like Aftershock and Electronics both being small niche boutique manufacturers, they don't really have the scale to customize designs to their liking. So what ends up happening is, well, this laptop is pretty much almost identical to the Electronics one. It makes my job reviewing it easier though, so I don't mind. Now, speaking of custom designs, this is clearly not very original looking. It definitely has a very strong Alienware vibe to it. I think it's inevitable to notice that. In my opinion though, I think it looks great, albeit a bit unoriginal. Though that RGB line vent might be a little bit too much for some people, me included, but it's something you can turn off. Build quality is respectable, there's no keyboard flex, and a generally good feeling selection of materials all around, so that's nice. Although the screen wobble is a bit problematic, at least, the screen can be lifted with just one finger, so it's not all bad. The keyboard is also excellent. Good amount of travel, I would prefer a little bit more. It's light and snappy, although I don't like the layout of the keyboard because it's kind of very squished together. It takes a bit to get used to because they've kind of shortened the enter and the backspace key to fit a number pad. And what ends up happening is you often end up kind of muscle memory hitting the number four or the dash instead of enter and backspace, respectively, because the enter and backspace keys were shortened to squeeze a numpad in. I think the numpad is a good trade-off for the shortened keys that make it very unnatural to type on. Uh, honestly, it's worth it, I think, for a lot of people with Excel spreadsheets and work to do. But for me, it's going to take a few weeks to get used to if I were to have this laptop as a daily driver. The track part is lovely as well. It's reasonably big. It's not the biggest one. I think it could be bigger. But it's nice, it's glass, it's smooth, and it's accurate, and it gets the job done. iOS, this laptop is extremely respectable. We've got mini display port on the back, HDMI, Ethernet, and USB-C on the back that can be used for display or connecting random things. There's also two USB-A's on the right side and one on the left, all USB 3.1. I'm not sure if it's Type 2, Gen 2, or Gen 3, or 3.2. It's, it's The naming convention for USB-C is a mess, but they're all USB 3 at the very least. The big clunky charger also plugs it into the back, and since we're on the topic of the charger, let's talk about the battery life. It's really quite poor on this laptop. The 64 watt hour battery in here does a good job of keeping the Ryzen 8 core processor with its integrated graphics alive for about four hours, just doing basic tasks like email and Word documents, but with that big display that's eating up battery and all the different powerful components in here, don't expect to use it for very long without a charger. And with the RTX 3070 being a full fat 130 watts one, you will not get the full experience unless you plug in and if you are planning to game on the go, you better have the ability to charge your laptop because you can't game on this 3070 for more than one and a half hours on battery. And honestly, after like 40 minutes, I was already having battery anxiety. So. Yeah, this is the laptop that's designed to be plugged in unless you're doing very menial tasks. Which is fair, it's a big chunky desktop replacement laptop. So, how is the laptop when you plug it in and use it for gaming and powerful tasks that it's really designed for? Well, the GPU in here is a full fat 130 watt RTX 3070, so it's going to be powerful for sure. And the one we have here is spec'd up with a 1TB SSD and 16 gigs of dual channel 3200 MHz RAM. This RAM is a Samsung made sodium. Nothing wrong with that, and it gets the job done pretty well. You can also get it with a 32 gig kit. You can configure it in Aftershock's website. Although, honestly, in my personal experience, I've not actually used even my desktop PC, which I use for streaming, 
to an extent that needs more than 16 gigs of RAM. So for most people, 16 gigs should be more than enough. And because the RTX 3070 is the full fat 130 watts one, not some sort of cut down 85 watt max Q version, it also means that it'll need plenty of cooling, but more on that in a bit when we talk about thermals because I did benchmark all of that. In Cinebench, the 5800H did really, really well. Uh, 9,000 multi-core score on Cinebench R23, about 8.8K, but almost 9,000. And for single core score, it did 1.48K, which is actually below the Intel 11th Gen 1165 i7 CPUs, but because this has better multi-core performance, in it's probably a better option to go with this for most CPU intensive tasks. In Cyberpunk 2077 at its 2560 by 1600 resolution, remember this display is 16 by 10, we'll talk about the display in a bit. On absolutely maxed out settings with ray tracing, cycle, everything, subsurface, reflection, scattering, blah, 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 at ultra, everything maxed out, cranked uh, with 16X and the aliasing, DLSS at balance, I could actually manage a very respectable 39 FPS on this laptop with a minimum of 35. So there was not a lot of frame dips anywhere. Now, if you're willing to turn it down a little, maybe play with ray tracing medium, you can play on DLSS with a performance preset and get like 50, 60 FPS. And if you're willing to tinker with the settings a bit, you can get a very smooth gaming experience. For me, I'm actually okay with 40 FPS because I am a story-driven gamer when it comes to Cyberpunk. So I only really care about the environment and the colors and the game. So for me, FPS is not a big deal in Cyberpunk. But if you're someone who wants to play 60 FPS Cyberpunk, if you're turning down the settings a little bit, which you will still get a very nice graphic quality anyway, with like ray tracing medium, you'll have a very good experience with much higher FPS as well. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, with everything maxed out, it's also the same story. It's super powerful and gets you many FPS with the benchmark results shown on the screen. And I really don't need to talk about CSGO because you're gonna get hundreds of FPS in this, no question. All that while running, pretty cool and pretty quiet. All that blistering hard work will tend to make laptops spin up and generate a lot of heat, especially with the RTX 3070 in here being a beastly hot device. And with the Apex 15R from Aftershock that I reviewed in the past, which had a very, very underbuilt cooling system, that was a noisy turbojet fan simulator noise mess. This, on the other hand, is much, much better. It's substantially better than the Apex 15R I reviewed a couple of weeks ago. Stress testing this with Fermat and Prime95 at the same time, the temps were quite well managed and never exceeded 90 degrees on both chips. By the way, I test my laptops in a air-conditioned, like temperature climate control room with the aircon at 22 degrees Celsius, so it's kind of reasonably cool. So if you are operating in a hotter environment, you know, Singapore's really hot, you're gonna expect higher temperatures than that. But at the same time of keeping the temperatures well below 90 degrees, the fence never whirred to a point where it was really audibly distracting and annoying. While they still did get pretty loud once the benchmarks and stress tests really got into it, and once it started approaching 80, 90 degrees Celsius, it never got so loud and jarring to the extent that it was worse than the Apex 15R. In fact, it was substantially better at max load compared to the Apex 15R. Now, to be fair, that Apex 15R did have a 3080 and this does only have a 3070, but it's nice to see that the fan noise is much better on this. And not only is the fan noise softer than on the Apex 15R, it's also a much lower frequency, so it's less high-pitched and jarring and ir irritating, and it doesn't have like random ramps in fan speed that that laptop has. Cooling on this laptop is definitely adequate for the RTX 3070 full fat 130 watts version here. And because modern GPUs and CPUs are so good at thermal and giving you extra performance if you have excess cooling and power delivery, the fact that it manages to keep the CPU and GPU temperatures down will mean that you'll get even more performance because your GPU and CPU will be able to turbo even more. However, if you're deaf to begin with and you just want maximum performance, you can just hit that red bright turbo button which I just did by accident so it's really loud. Ah! Uh. You see what I mean? If you're deaf to begin with. However, if you're deaf to begin with and you just want maximum performance at the cost of noise and silence and comfort, you can just hit that bright red square turbo button on the top right corner of the keyboard and just have max fan speed activated. What this does is it just ramps the fan speed up to max regardless of temperature to give you maximum cooling. Now this gets the fan noise up to a very annoying jarring level, very high-pitched and terrible to listen to. 
but it does give you plenty of cooling performance, which might be what you need if you're in a very hot environment, a very hot room, and you know, you need that little bit of extra cooling juice. Now, I personally wouldn't use this all the time because it's probably not that good for your fans to be constantly running at 100%, but it's something that you might want to use if you say, want to quickly cool down your laptop after an intense gaming session and the fan noise is just too loud to bet. Or, you know, in the middle of a gaming session, your laptop's average temperature has gotten up to kind of a overly high and your fan noise has gotten to a excessive level that you don't really like. You can turn on turbo mode, bury it for a minute or two, and then turn it off and your temps will have been brought down by the fans ramping up to max speed, which is pretty good. We've talked about touch, heat, hearing. What senses are we still missing out on? Smell and sight. Smells good, smells like a medium rare steak, but clearly the sense that we are missing out on the most importantly is sight. The display of this thing is not talked about so far. And the reason I've left it to the last is because, well, it's kind of one of the most interesting part of this laptop. It's a 16 inch 2560 by 1600 display. So 16 by 10 aspect ratio. And I love this because I love taller displays. And I hope they are here to stay because it really is super conducive for fitting more lines of text on a web page or a script or a document onto your screen. And if you're someone who's trying to do a lot of work, having a taller screen really, really helps. While this does not affect your gameplay experience at all, apart from having to push a couple more pixels and power a couple more pixels, it does make a massive difference that is quite noticeable in work. Not only do you have more space to deal with documents, you don't have to like move your taskbar to the side of the screen if you want to see more lines of text. You already have the extra 140 pixels real estate, which is really, really useful for work. And chances are, if you can afford a laptop like this, $2,700 is not a small amount of money. If you can afford a gaming laptop like this, you probably have a lot of work to get done, so go get that bag, Tiger. As for gaming and media consumption, the display is really quite lovely as well. It's saturated, it's contrasty, it's punchy, it's nice. Just don't expect the colours to be good for colour grading because it's far from very accurate with quite high delta E values and only covers 69% of the DCI P3 colour space and a similarly known number for the Adobe RGB colour space. It does have 98% of sRGB colour space. It's quoted as 100% but my measurements only say 98 so it might be because it's a pre-production model. So it's enough for movies, games and 8-bit basic colour grading but if you want to do more fancy professional work, well, this display is not going to cut it. If you're buying this laptop for gaming or media consumption or work alone, like one of those three or all of those three things, you will be more than happy with this display. Apart from the good aspect ratio, which is very conducive for getting work done, it's a lovely 165Hz variable refresh rate G-Sync display. So you're going to have a very nice gaming experience on it and it has good viewing angles because it is an IPS panel. However, there is a uneven touch of backlight bleed in the top right corner of this particular pre-production model. And obviously it's probably because it's pre-production because the backlight bleed is very well controlled on the other areas of the display. So just pointing out why there might be a blob of light in the top right corner in my B-roll. That is not a big deal. But what is a big deal or a bigger deal to me is the screen brightness. It only goes as bright as 200 roughly candela per meter square, which is I think 200 nits. And that is really quite low. It's not that bright at all. Well, it gives very nice colors and it still feels very saturated and punchy. That brightness does hurt it if you're trying to use it outside of a dimly lit room. If you're using it under bright lights or using it near a bright window, which might be a problem because Singapore sun is really bright, or you're using it outdoors, that might be a concern. Thankfully though, I know most gamers never see the sun and most gamers just stay in their mom's basement, so that might not be a big deal. But if you're planning to set up this laptop near a bright window, get ready to close the curtains if you want to get the full, really good looking screen experience. But if you're okay with using it indoors or keeping it in the shade, the screen is a very good time. It's just that brightness is a bit lacking. Okay, so that's very interesting about all the features and usage experience with this. Let's open it up so we can see what's inside, see the cooling, see all that performance. Let's get into it. So opening up this laptop is really as easy as removing 11 screws. Now Aftershock doesn't cover opening it up with, with their warranty, but it is very easy to do and it's reasonably safe so long as you don't randomly prod the circuit board with your screwdriver. And opening up, you get to see the really lovely cooling solution and the battery. The battery is a 64 watt hours as I've talked about before 
and you should be able to replace this if you know where to look, but I have no idea where to look, so I can't help you there. The cooling system is actually quite interesting to look at. We've got three big heat pipes for the GPU, with one dedicated to just the GPU, with two being shared with the CPU, and the CPU is also cooled by those two big heat pipes and its own tiny little extra CPU heat sink pipe, heat pipe. Now this is actually substantially better than the Apex 15R setup. We've got bigger heat pipes, bigger fans, more copper, more heat sinks, and the amount of ventilation in this chassis and design is, it's apparent that cooling was a priority. The whole bottom cover for the laptop has a gigantic air intake mesh section so that there's plenty of space for your fans to breathe and there's heat sinks on the intakes, there's heat sinks on the exhaust and they are bigger than those found on the Apex 15R which mind you had an RTX 3080 and an even more powerful CPU. So that's why the cooling performance on this laptop is good. It's not overbuilt, but it's built well and the cooling system is designed well, which is good because Singapore is so damn hot. If your gaming laptop didn't have a good cooling system, it will probably thermal throttle. And with modern CPUs and GPUs being so good, if you keep their thermals below their thermal throttling li limit, they, they will be able to turbo and stretch their legs. But their cooling solution is definitely appreciated and it's good to see that the new Aftershock products have improved over the old ones. And a full fat 130 watt RTX 370 is going to need all the help that it can get. In terms of upgradability, you can easily upgrade the SSD here. The SSD found here is a Lexa 1TB NM 630 SSD. It gets the job done. You can configure what SSD you want on Aftershock. Shock's website. You've got two RAM slots, they're filled with a dual channel 16 gig kit from Samsung, 3200 megahertz, fast enough for Ryzen processors, no problem. And you can easily upgrade the SSD by slotting another SSD into the other NVMe slot or you can just replace the original SSD to begin with if so desired. Now if I were to buy this laptop, I'll probably slap in 32 gigs of RAM myself and slap in like 8 terabytes of SSD storage just so I can do video editing on it. But one man can dream that he has that level of money one day. I don't have that money right now. So. Now closing it back up, let's talk about the two things that I've not talked about so far which I think are some concerns with this laptop and that is the speakers and the webcam on this laptop. Both of them really feel like placeholders. They just feel like something to tick a spec sheet because they're really not that good. The webcam is 720p, it's noisy, it's not really clear, it looks quite bad. If you're just doing a zoom or a Skype call in a pinch, it gets the job done and it's better than nothing, that's for sure. But it is a bit underwhelming. Uh, but it is not a $4,000 laptop like the Apex 15R, so I would not dock as many points as on that Apex 15R. Also, the speakers are not that great. They do sound alright, I mean they're not distorted at max volume, but they're far from loud and they're far from impactful or fun, so it's good enough to just watch some YouTube videos, but if you really want to have a good time in terms of audio, plug in a headset or plug in a set of speakers because uh, they, the built-in ones don't cut it. And with that, it's conclusion time. Honestly, the Revo 16R is actually quite impressive of a laptop. At its price of $2,679 at pre-order, with its recommended spec of RTX 3070, Ryzen 7 5800H, 16 gigs of RAM and one terabyte SSD, that's the recommended spec which I have gotten here. It's actually quite a lot of performance and quite a lot of features and stuff for your money. From a full fat 3070 that isn't a cut down 130 watt GPU, if you get a 3060 it's also a full fat one, not a max Q version, it to a powerful CPU that is plenty for both video editing and gaming, as well as a lovely, lovely looking display, apart from the fact that it's a bit dim, it's a really nicely done laptop. What I appreciate about the Revo 16R, I think, is that it's a complete package. It's well cooled, it's reasonably quiet for a laptop with its power level, and it's got plenty of refinements all around that make it feel more than just, you know, a boutique niche budget-oriented product. While it seems like an Alienware clone, I think it's more fair to just call it what it is, a good laptop that kind of looks like Alienware. Because it really is a good product. And for its price, it's hard to find a laptop that can truly compete with it in terms of its spec sheet, at least at the time of release. Things might change with pricing and availability and sales, but right now, at the time of upload, it's very hard to find many laptops with this level of performance, with this level of well-roundedness at this price. So good job Aftershock, the Revo 16R is substantially better than the Apex 15R that I checked out in the past. So then, the Revo 16R and all of its global counterparts from brands like Electronics from the same manufacturer with different names, this laptop should definitely be on your watch list if you're looking for a laptop in its price range, with its spec range, and it should be 
near the top of that watch list just because it really is quite impressive. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching. Follow me on Instagram, join my Discord, like, subscribe, comment, all those YouTuber thingies at the end of the video. They're all linked in the description. You can do it. It's free. It's super easy. And the 10,000 subscriber giveaway is coming really, really soon. And when that subscriber giveaway comes, well, the people who subscribe before 10K get more gifts than the people who subscribe after. I'll see you guys next time. Uh, adios. Goodbye. Zaijian. Woo! Long ass video. Let's go.